Welcome to Top Notch Online TV, a paragon of excellence. Today with you is Teacher Rispa, a teacher of English and Literature, an author, as well as an examiner, a teacher from PCA Kikuyu High School. Today we are demystifying literature. We are looking at one among the optional set books, a set book by the name of An Artist of the Floating World uh, uh, by Kazuo Ishiguro. In understanding of the book, we need to understand the background of the book. In understanding the background, we are going to demystify things such as what is it about the artist, what do we need to know about the setting, as well as, uh, as, well as the history of Japan. I'll start with the author. When I'm talking about the author, I'll be looking at Kazuo Ishiguro. What can you say about the author? The author is Japanese-born but he also has British nationality. He was born in Japan at a place called Nagasaki, but later on migrated to Britain, where he acquired a citizenship as well. Kazuo Ishiguro is a renowned author. He has even won a Nobel Prize in Literature for his work. Another thing we need to understand in the introduction of the book, understanding the background that enables a better understanding of the book, we are going to look at the setting the setting will be looked at in terms of place and time. Where was this action taking place? During which era are we talking about an artist of the floating world? I'll start with setting in terms of place. Uh, even looking at the naming of the people and the references made, we are talking about Japan. In terms of place, the setting is Japan. In terms of time, setting is some, partly it is before the start of World War II, but later on, at the end of World War II and within the era of occupation of America, occupation of Japan, sorry, occupation of Japan by the Americans. That is the era we are talking about. We are dealing with uh, years such as 1930s up to the era of 1950s. That is the setting in terms of time. And as you're understanding setting, and also the matters that are being raised in the book, uh, matters that are crucial and they need to be understood, I'll be looking at some terminologies that will help us to understand the history of Japan. I'll start talking about nationalism. Nationalism as something that has featured greatly in an artist of the floating world. In, in the history of Japan, there came a time that Japan wanted to uh, went, wanted to weigh itself against other countries. It wanted to see how mighty it might be. Therefore, it went ahead conquering colonies. In 1930, it conquered China. After conquering China, people are now having that spirit of nationalism. We need to be felt as Japan. We need to expand our territories. And now they began to advance and wanted to conquer the whole of the Pacific. This did not settle well with USA. And at a certain time, as Japanese were getting uh, aggressive and they want to conquer their neighbors, there was the era of World War II. During the World War II, the War went on for quite some time, but finally, Japan was defeated. What marked the defeat of Japan? Japan was defeated after America, after USA, used the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, bringing an end to the war with Japan having to retreat. So when you're looking at this a book, when you're studying the book, we are about to see some people that were inciting the younger generation, the Japanese people to go into war and conquer other territories. And it looked like something desirable, something good back then. But now after the defeat, after they were defeated in the World War II and they had to surrender, what happened is that uh, it was now looked at, these people who was uh, who were inciting them to go to war, they, now, they were now looked at as uh, political suspects they had led the country astray. Some of them even went ahead, admitted their involvement, but others did not want to be known that they were involved in inciting Japan to go into war. That is, about, that is it about nationalism. Another thing we need, uh, that we need to be aware of in the history of Japan, we are looking at an aspect that we call harakiri. Harakiri will also be featured within the book. Harakiri is an aspect of, that can be described as honorable suicide. 
Among the Japanese people, it is not frowned upon that someone takes their own life so that they can save the honor of their family. Instead of bringing embarrassment to your family, and then you take your own life, it is considered an honorable act. Therefore, harakiri will be referred to as, can be defined as honorable suicide. Another terminology that will enable us to understand even the setting of the book, there's something you're calling the occupation era. The occupation era came in after the, the, after the Japanese surrendered. Upon the Japanese surrendering, now America made Japan to become its own colony. Therefore, the rules that were being applied were the rules that were from the Americans. The, the Japan are now working under the Americans. This is the era during which the story is featured. The Americans have taken over and they're now the new masters and they are wielding power over Japan. That becomes the occupation era that was running from around the end of World War II, 1945, towards the 1950s. And once the Americans took over, they even went ahead and freed China. They now gave freedom to China. China had already been conquered earlier on by the Japanese. And finally, as we are looking at the introduction of an artist of the floating world, let's look at the title, an artist of the floating world. Looking at the determiner, an artist, we are looking at, they are talking about a specific person. A specific person who is one, the artist. Now, who is the artist? The artist refers to someone called Ono. Ono is the main character who is telling us the story from first person narration. He's, he's telling us his story, cutting across his past and the present. And he wants us to understand what really is influencing uh, his decisions. Apart from an artist, we are going to look at the floating world. The book is majorly centered around the theme of, centered around the theme of art. And now this floating world, mostly during that time, they used to capture paintings that centered around a good time when people are making merry, people are drinking, people are laughing loudly. Now that becomes the floating world. Now specifically, you're talking about Ono and his paintings during that time, paintings that were inclusive of the good time they were having in the floating world. That becomes the background towards understanding an artist of the floating world. Then the author goes ahead, instead of breaking, instead of arranging his work into chapters, he goes ahead and arranges the work in terms of time errors. The first time error we are talking about October 1948. That should be about three years or two years, uh, about three years after the end of the World War. The second chapter, we can, we can call it the second chapter, but then it has been called June 1949. The third one becomes November 1949. And the final uh, era becomes June 1950. If you are understanding the introduction of the book, we are talking about the era of American occupation of Japan. And some people are, do not want to be associated with what happened to Japan. They feel that them making people to get the feelings of nationalism, aggressive, and let me talk about aggressive nationalism, making people, whipping up the emotions of people, making them to want to fight their neighbors, conquering and all, but then it led to Japan losing the war. That becomes, uh, that becomes something that others are not proud of. They're now regretting their earlier involvement. And then I'll be looking at the plot summary. The plot summary, Let's start with the largest of them. We are looking at October 1948. October 1948, as the play unfolds, we are meeting Ono. And Ono is an artist whose fame is now waning. He is now, his fame is now fading. It is, he is not as famous as he used to be when he was painting some photos that were, uh, that were making people to become nationalistic now. Uh, people no longer want to associate with Ono. And as the play, uh, the play unfolds, Ono appears and he's narrating the story from first person narration. He is telling us about how he acquired his house. And from his description, we are looking at his house being one that is prestigious. From his own descri description, he says, 
looking at his house, you might be tempted to think that he's a wealthy man. Then you're wondering, if the house is that prestigious and he says he's not a wealthy man, how did he come to own that house? We are learning that he owned the house from, he, from his predecessor, someone called Akira Sugimura. Akira Sugimura was also an artist and he wanted his house to go to someone of honor. And now they auctioned the house on the basis of honor. They are not interested in the money. Now the family, uh, Ono had to compete against, uh, against four other contenders whom, who will own the house. And the family of Akira finally decided Ono should be the person who will own the house. And they wrote a certain amount of money on a piece of paper. And they were, uh, the, the amount of money was quite minimal. Ono was almost protesting. How come you're giving me such a small, how come you're asking out of me such a small amount of money? But then they wanted it to be someone honorable owning their house. This one should tell us that Ono by then, by the time he was being given that house, he was a person who was highly recognized. And then we are getting further into the understanding of the first episode, June 1948. In understanding of June 1948, we are looking at Ono, Ono and his relationship with his family, the nuclear family. His nuclear family, we are understanding is now comprising of a daughter, to, sorry, it is now comprom comprising of two daughters as well as a grandson and one among his daughters, Setsuko, is already married. We want to understand their relationship. How are these people relating? We are looking at, uh, we are looking at Ono, Masuji Ono. In fact, his name is Masuji Ono, the main character, the one who is telling his story from the first person narration. Masuji Ono is someone who is, who is uh, relating with his daughters one of them he stays with. The name of the daughter he's staying with is Noriko. Noriko seems to be someone who is outspoken and seems to be harboring some kind of bitterness towards the father. We'll find out later why is Noriko very bitter towards the father. Then there's another relationship we're going to talk about. Let's talk about Setsuko and the relationship with the father. Setsuko, we are being told, they're looking at her outward appearance and even the father and he, even her own father and mother, they are considering her as not being so pretty. They looked at her and they were always joking that she will bloom in the summer. She'll become beautiful later on in life. She was looking more of a boy. Maybe this might be what is contributing to her lack, her lack of confidence. She is always second guessing herself. Setsuko is, she wants to say something, but then she hides it under the guise of, oh, I did not really mean to say that. She's someone who is lacking of confidence. Setsuko is the eldest daughter of Ono, Masuji Ono, and she has a son, a son by the name of Ichiro. Ichiro, upon coming to visit the grandfather, on this episode as it is opening, we are seeing that uh, Setsuko had brought along her son, Ichiro, to visit their grandfather. Looking at Ichiro, we are seeing a boy who looks like he's spoiled. The kind of way he is speaking to the grandfather, keep quiet, can't you see I'm working? That is a kind of a boy who is only seven years old, about six, seven years, but he is speaking to the, uh, to the grandfather with some kind of disrespect. I still want to talk about Ichiro. We are looking at the family. Uh, we are looking, in this episode, we are looking at family members of Masuji Ono. The grandson also is embracing the Western culture. Remember by this time that, remember by this time we are looking at the American occupation of, of Japan. And some people are taking to it, especially the younger generation. They're admiring the Americans. Among an example in sight, we can talk about Ichiro. Ichiro is always imitating the American cowboy. He's also talking about Hiyo, Silva. And he's trying to ask the grandfather, try to guess who am I imitating? The grandfather cannot point a finger at who he's imitating. He's thinking that the boy is imitating some great Japanese leader. But later on, you're learning the boy had once been taken by the parents to watch a Japanese movie and he can't get it out of his head. He's fascinated uh, by the Americans. He once went to watch an American movie to do with cowboys. And from then onwards, he has always been fascinated by the American cowboys. Ichiro is also talking constantly about a certain lizard 
a certain huge lizard that was brought to that was angered into waking up it was disturbed to come out of its slumber and if you're interpreting the book we are looking at the movie of godzilla they're talking about godzilla which has its root its roots in japan japan this is ichiro as a young boy i can't move away without mentioning that there's still another aspect there's another family member who is being mentioned at the time being we are looking at setsuko's husband a man by the name of suichi Suichi, we are being told, earlier on as he was meeting Masuji Ono, he was quite a respectable young man. But then later on, he is showing a lot of disrespect towards Ono. He doesn't even want to be in the same place with Ono. He has some kind of disregard towards his father-in-law. We are also going, as the story progresses, we are also going to see why is Suichi holding, harboring such bitter feelings towards the father-in-law. That is it about the family. And we can also talk about two more family members that are in absentia. We are going to talk about Masuji Ono's wife, who, uh, who died. And also he lost a son by the name of Kenji during the war. Kenji had been among the young people who went into war. When this when they were being incited into having feelings of nationalism, they took it to heart and went to fight for Japan, Japan to conquer new territories. And that is where Kenji, the only son of Masuji Ono, lost his life. We can still look at other aspects in this chapter. We are also going to look at there is uh, what is happening presently. You know, the book cuts across are. Uh, flashback and going back into the present presently what is happening is we are being told about a certain marriage negotiation we can call it a miai miai a japanese word the miai is ongoing but then there's a family that was supposed to be engaged to marry the second daughter of masuji ono and the family was miyake's family there was a son by the name of Jiro. Jiro was to marry Noriko, but then the family pulled out. Now there's a suspicion hanging in the air. Why did, why did the Miyake family have to pull out? We're also going to find out the reason later. Why did the family pull out? The negotiation seemed to be going on well, but then they broke their engagement. Presently, we are having the family of Masuji Ono negotiating with a new suitor, someone by the name of Taro, Taro Saito. Now he belongs to another new family of the Saitos. The Miyakes pulled out and they did not give a very good reason. In fact, Ono, when he's being confronted by the daughter, the elder daughter, why did the family pull out from marrying my younger sister? He says, they were an honorable family. Looking at them, they were not, they could not hold a candle to our family. They belonged to a lower, non-prestigious family. That is why they pulled out according to what Ono is telling his elder daughter. Currently, we are at new marriage negotiations. Still on the first episode of June 1948, we can look at earlier influences that led that led Masuji Ono into becoming an artist. We are being told about Masuji Ono and he used to paint in secret. He, his father had looked forward to the fact that my son will take over the family business. The father used to be dealing with cash. He would call Masuji to his reception and he would be giving him a speech about money, uh, showing him how to count the coins, uh, uh, bundle the notes. But then little did the father know the son is not really interested in taking over the family business. The son is busy painting and painting in secret. You people should remember that the artist, an artist of the floating world, is majorly in reference to Masuji Ono. Now I'm talking about an incident that shaped his path into becoming an artist. His mother had reported to the father that your son intends to be taking in, intends to be planning on taking painting or being an artist as a career path this had made the father very angry and the father had wanted to be uh the father had called for the son and he wanted to be uh, to be made to understand why would you want to become an artist and at that moment he had asked uh, masuji ono bring your paintings the son had uh, the son had surrendered the paintings, but he had left 
out about two paintings, uh, some that are his favorites. Then the father had gone ahead and burnt those paintings as a way of discouraging the son, the son, discouraging the son. I do not want my son to become an artist. This is a calling of people that end up being poor, living in squalor. That was the reason the father was against him becoming an artist. But even after burning his paintings, what Ono had, uh, had confirmed with the mother is that it had only strengthened his resolve into becoming an artist, into becoming a painter. Therefore, the father's burning of the paint was, uh, was just a useless attempt. It was futile. We're also looking at the journey through the art world. Later on, you're seeing that he succeeded into becoming a, an artist. Upon becoming an, art, an artist, he takes us through his journey. Where did his journey begin? The first one we're looking at, he worked under someone called Master Takeda. Master Takeda, they used to paint mass paintings that they were selling to tourists. But then later on, uh, Masuji Ono was identified by someone, a great artist by the name of Moriyama. Moriyama, we shall popularly be calling him as Morisan. Morisan identified him as a worthy artist that he wanted to take under his tutelage. He wanted to have Masuji Ono as his apprentice. Therefore, he invited Masuji Ono to become one among his apprentices and to be working in his villa. And Masuji Ono also, also saw the uh, need to also poach one among his friends that he used to work with at the villa, at Master Takeda's villa. He decided to take along someone that we are calling the tortoise. He got the name the tortoise because he used to work very slowly. And uh, later on, you are seeing that uh, Totois was reluctant. He's reluctant to be a traitor. I don't want to betray uh, Master Takeda. He took me in after the after he was after a good word was put in for me so that I can work over here. I'm not even among the best. But later on, the fact that the tortoise is also working under Morisan, we're able to fill in the blanks and know that he also went ahead and he also went ahead and joined working and joined Ono working under Master Takeda. Master Takeda and uh, sorry, working under Morisan. Morisan and uh, Ono also fell out later. Details that you are going to learn in yet another episode. We cannot leave this episode without speaking about Masuji Ono's students. And I'll concentrate on two particular students. I'll be talking about one among them, Shintaro. Shintaro, according to Masuji Ono, he's not among the best of his students, but there, there seems to be some kind of bootlicking. Shintaro is a bootlicker. He's always excessively praising Masuji Ono. Therefore, Masuji Ono also likes to be in the company of Shintaro. And we are being told that this loyalty was stemming from the fact that one day, Masuji Ono helped the brother of Shintaro into acquiring a white collar job. And because of that fact, Shintaro is forever grateful to Ono for having played, for having played a role in that. Away from Shintaro, also, I'll also be talking about yet another student of Masuji Ono, a student by the name of Kuroda. Kuroda had been a protege, had been that person who was a, a student of Masuji Ono. He looked, at, he looked like he was very promising and Masuji Ono was very proud of, was very proud of Kuroda. Later on, they also will fall out a detail that we'll also have to tackle later as we are looking at the page analysis, uh, as you look at the analysis page by page. Uh, we are, finally, we are not going to uh, move away without talking about the Migihidari. The Migihidari was a pub, was a bar at which people used to converge. It used to be a place of pleasure. And this is where most of the time, Ono spent with his, the best of his students among them, we are looking at Kuroda. They would, uh, they would paint over there, they would exchange ideas, they would make merry and be happy. Now that becomes the basis of where the floating world was taking place.
uh, as we're coming to the end of this, let's just mention later on, with the fall of the Megihidari, we are seeing that someone we cannot fail to mention, someone called Mrs. Kawakami. Mrs. Kawakami was also an owner of a pub, but a smaller establishment. But upon the fall of the Megihidari, that huge pub that used to attract a lot of customers, Mrs. Kawakami's place comes into focus. That is it about our introduction and the plot summary of the first episode taking place between June 1948. And that is it for today. Until next time, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us.